My name is uh, Professor Raman Bedi. I am the um, chair of this session, uh, chair of the Global Child Dental Fund and Emeritus Professor at King's College London. On the panel, we also have uh, Professor Callum Durwood, who is the Dean at the University of Putisastra in Cambodia. And we have Dr. Jacob um, Johns, who is from the University of Malay. So our speaker today is a very eminent person from India. We're really delighted, uh, to for you to join us, is uh, Dr. Nanim, Nani Nam, sorry, I'll get it. Nani Meni, Nani Meni. Um, and I practiced that for a while, so I apologize for getting that slightly wrong. Who's going to speak to us on the all healthcare in medically compromised with a particular focus on endocrine, renal, gastrointestinal, and then to uh, round it up uh, to with patients with cancer. Thank you so much for giving up your time to, to prepare this lecture, and we'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Arun. Thanks, Dr. Raman. Thanks very much for that introduction. Dr. Jacob, good to see you again. Dr. Kalam, glad meeting you. I thank uh, Global Child Dental Fund for organizing this series of lectures for the global benefit. I welcome uh, uh, audiences across the world and to get something from um, from this lecture to take home. Thanks very much. I uh, hope you're all doing well. We, are, we thought we almost got out of COVID, then again, we are down under. I hope you're near and dear are doing fine. I hope uh, things are getting better in your countries and uh, hope we maintain our uh, safety distances from people and keep the mask on and keep the COVID away. I don't know where this Omicron is going to take us. Hopefully things are getting better. Uh, today's topic is going to be part of the lectures uh, uh, to address uh, the dental care bit for medically compromised individuals. Specifically today, we are going to talk about uh, patients suffering from renal conditions, gastrointestinal conditions, endocrine conditions, and patients with cancer. The broader theme is to the work with the team, work with the team. And I also uh, uh, wish to convey my regards from Federation of Special Care Dentistry. Uh, we have running into the second year now. This is specially to address and uh, make a forum for the, for, the, for the dentists and the medical fraternity to, to join hands to serve the needy people who are the patients with the special needs. I welcome all the participants to participants to join this group and uh, share your uh, uh, time, your knowledge and clinical skills to serve the, to the needy. The oral cavity is in the intersection of medicine and the dentistry and the window to the general health of the patient. This is very true as we have many studies which address the relationship between and the systemic disease. And there is a association between the oral condition system and the disease. But the problem is we need not address such issues with the context of the disease, but the good oral health alone justifies preventing the oral disease and maintain the oral health so that it reduces the burden on the people who are already burdened with the systemic condition. So there is a weak relationship that every oral condition is going to be affecting the systemic disease. But having the good oral hygiene alone is going to be a greatest benefit for these people so that they are not going to be additionally burdened with the dental disease. So with this context, we are going to look at the whole uh, the topic. As a dentist or a dental surgeon, you are going to play a role of either a primary consultant or a secondary consultant. I'm trying to lay down a theme of the team so that we will find the place where we are going to be so that we will play a key role in, 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 in the medical uh, uh, therapies 
as a dentist and as a, as a cog of the wheel. When you have your patient admitted under you, it will become obviously a primary consultant. And when you refer your patient for any medical doctor, then he is going to be the secondary consultant. That is, a physician can refer a patient to the dentist before they start the medical treatment, or a dentist can refer the patient to a physician before for the medical assessment before we initiate the dental treatment. So it all going to start with the prevention and it is going to start with before that before the, the, the treatment plan happens. We do have we do work under three, two situations. One, we either we work in the office phase to dental practice or in a hospital where you are part of a team. Our practice broadly divides into a regular dental clinical procedures provided in a dental office for an ambulatory inpatients or outpatients or provision of the care for the bedside patients admitted in a hospital for the medical reasons, or an inpatient who is in a hospital for purely dental condition. These are the various conditions under which we work and help the people. Before we go further, there are three essential tools we have to keep in our practices and be familiar with. That is one, the pulse oximeter, uh, the glucometer, and the sphygmomanometer, that's a BP apparatus. Thanks to COVID, we all know about pulse oximeter now, but the rest of the two should be, should be familiar with us in our dental practices. Whether we, we do practice and cater patients with special needs or not, these are three essential tools which should be a great benefit to your practice. So it's, it's important to keep them handy. I'm sure all of us have this. If nobody has it, probably we should procure these three tools which will make uh, dental practice much more comfortable and safer for, for, for people who suffer from systemic conditions. And especially when you, when you are handling uh, a, a stranger as a patient to come to your practices, you should be familiar with all these tools with you. We also need to be aware of something called clinical alert monitoring. We always do this when you are in a practice only thing is we don't realize that we are, we are observing these things. One is consciousness, that is to, to assess the response to the patient, response of a patient to your verbal command. This way we'll know whether the person is conscious or he has any altered uh, uh, sense of consciousness. We also need to monitor the respiration or rate of respiration. And we also need to know about saturation of the patient. Fortunately for us, we work in an environment surrounded by the mucosa, which is a true replica of the saturation of the body, total mucosa. Apart from that, as we mentioned, the blood pressure monitoring and the pulse monitoring is also an essential part of uh, a general monitoring of the patient. Today, we are going to talk about the, the, the oral health care in medically compromised individuals suffering from renal, gastrointestinal, endocrine conditions and patients with cancer. Next, we come across treating uh, patients with uh, cancer and, uh, and, and uh, what kind of oral care we need to provide them uh, in a patient with uh, suffering from cancers. Uh, we do have uh, patients suffering from solid tumors such as lung cancers, breast, colorectal, head and neck and prostate cancers. And the treatment basically involves multidisciplinary approach combining with the surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is basically to, to reduce the spread of the, uh, uh, the cancer cells. Radiation is basically reduce the size of the cancer uh, in, the, in the solid organs. Surgery is to eliminate the, uh, the cancer uh, part. Hematological malignancies, which are common even in children, uh, which include uh, leukemia, multiple myeloma, and uh, lymphoma. Treatment is primarily of hematological disease, the treatment primarily because uh, by, by, by chemotherapy. Radiation is not very common for uh, hematological malignancies, exception being Hodgkin's, sympho Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, the objectives of the oral care in patients suffering from cancer can be a long-term objective and, and, and a short-term objective. Short-term objectives basically need to consider, uh, 
consider the reduce in the complications arising due to the cytoreductive therapy. Because of the chemotherapy or high intensity chemotherapy, the cells are going to be uh, destroyed so much and the hematopoiesis is going to be reduced so much that uh, there is going to be severe compromise of the blood cells uh, in the body and uh, which, is going to be, which is going to reduce the fighting capacity of the body. The key strategy of these people uh, in a short term uh, goal is to eliminate all potential source of infection. So whenever they are, they are going to be scheduled for the uh, chemotherapy, uh, and whenever there is going to be severe cytoreduction of, uh, uh, during the chemotherapy, we need to uh, address the caries and periodontal infections and all associated infections in the mouth, such as associated with the impacted third molars, are to be addressed right in the beginning so that we don't come across uh, any infection during the, uh, uh, the cytoreductive therapy. Removing all sharp edges is going to provide a uh, uh, lot of comfort to the patients and uh, reduction of any sharp uh, smoothing of any respirations are going to be most important comforting uh, strategy for them during the cytoreductive therapy. The long-term objective for these people who are suffering from oral cancer and, uh, and uh, cancer later is to, is to extract the mutilated teeth uh, uh, so that they don't come across uh, complications a little later, and especially during post-irradiation uh, uh, in, in people. Uh, when these teeth, which may not be very painful, or you may think that it, it, it is not a, a very great uh, uh, thing to address at that point of time, when they go uncontrolled, when the, the disease gets worsened, and during the radiation procedure, radiation process, uh, any extraction is going to be very, very difficult for them. And uh, the healing of the wound is going to be very difficult. Sometimes uh, they're going to take a long time for the healing to happen. And uh, sometimes it can even result in necrosis. Uh, anticipate uh, the trismus and hyposalivation because of uh, 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 radiation. So we need to provide enough care for them to counter uh, trismus and uh, hyposalivation by giving proper care and proper exercises to, 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 to improve the mouth opening during the radiation. And, uh, and uh, I will address how the hyposalivation is going to be addressed in a few slides. And we also need to consider something called chronic graft versus host disease, which I'm going to talk a little later. And we need to educate the patient regarding short-term and long-term oral complications during uh, cancer therapy and take them into confidence about why we need to address all those issues right in the beginning rather than end up uh, complications during the chemotherapy and radiation therapy a little later. And, uh, yeah. and uh, pre-treatment evaluation of these people who suffer from cancer need to be assessed with the presenting symptoms. What kind of a dental symptoms are they presenting with uh, uh, before the treatment? And uh, treatment should be started, started with the symptoms first. And we also need to keep in mind about uh, the values, the, uh, the blood the values in terms of uh, complete hemogram so that we know how the cells are going to be in the counts during the cytoreductive therapy, during uh, uh, chemotherapy. Necessary antibiotic prophylaxis need to be appropriately considered because the seemingly small infections and seemingly small source of bacteremia can flare up into a major disaster in these people. Clinical examination should include uh, all the extraoral uh, parts such as uh, uh, examine for asymmetries, should be examined for uh, swellings and the sources of swellings all aspects of the skin, both the mucosa and the skin. Lymph nodes need to be examined properly for probable, pro probable uh, uh, swellings. Temporomandibular joint need to be assessed properly so that we don't come across in a temporomandibular joint as an issue later, which is going to be affecting them in terms of mouth opening, especially during radiation therapy a little later. Interval examination, all the soft tissues and the buccal mucosa should be examined properly. Floor of the mouth should be examined for any conditions or any swellings. Tongue need to be examined for, for 
the palatal swellings, palatal ulcerations, and palatal conditions, discoloration should be assessed for. Oropharynx should be examined for erythema, any, any ulcerations or any, ulcer, any erosions. Any mucosal hemorrhages, swellings, and other lesions need to be assessed and made a note of that uh, in, in the case files and uh, let the physician also be aware of, or the oncologist be aware of such situations. Uh, saliva need to be assessed for its volume and the consistency because of radiation and the radiation consequences later, the, the, con the quantity of the saliva might come down and the consistency of the saliva will become very thick. So, uh, so this need to be addressed right in the beginning so that we will be proactively assisting them in terms of the salivary quality. Radiographic examination uh, with the full mouth intraoral periapical films, uh, which need to be kept for the records. Panoramic radiograph for the bone uh, conditions uh, 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 in the maxilla and mandible. If needed, cone beam uh, CT need to be advised for. Any previous radiographic records, if they are available, they need to be keep uh, uh, ready so that uh, uh, we can have uh, uh, ongoing dental disease or caries or periodontal conditions are assessed for properly. Treatment planning should be addressed uh, uh, with the view that there is always a risk of infection during the neutropenia or uh, uh, cytoreductive uh, therapy, uh, during the chemotherapy especially. And uh, there is always a risk of uh, osteoradionecrosis during the radiation, risk of infection and bleeding following the dental procedures, following uh, 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 extractions uh, during the, uh, and the infection associated with them need to be uh, kept in mind so that we address all these issues right in the beginning of the treatment planning uh, rather than predisposing these people for these infections a little later. Graft versus host disease is something which we need to uh, know about, which we are going to talk a little later on this. Timing of the treatment in people with, uh, with uh, cancer therapy is very important because uh, when people go through hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in, in, in uh, hematological malignancies, uh, which is otherwise called a HSCT, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, uh, people are going to be, the patients are going to be put through high intensity cancer therapy. When they're put to high intensity cancer therapy, uh, uh, the chemotherapy, the chemotherapy is going to destroy all the hematopoietic cells and the cells which are circulating in the body. And so uh, the hematopoietic stem cells are going to be once into the body, they are going to start making the fresh cells in the body and those fresh cells, which are expected to be healthier than the, uh, the, the diseased uh, hematopoiesis. So because of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, the harvesting need to be done prior to the high intensity chemotherapy. And such a harvesting should be done from the patient a few weeks prior to the chemotherapy. So when such a harvest is planned, the dental treatment should be avoided three to four days prior to the procedure because then we may contaminate uh, uh, the blood because of the dental uh, infection, which is going to be because of the bacteria. So avoid all dental treatments at least three to four days prior to the stem cell harvesting from the blood. Planning of the surgical and extraction procedures should be considered keeping WBC and platelet matter and we are going to talk about nadir in a separate slide. All surgical procedures should be done at least one week prior to the radiation because once the radiation starts, the bone metabolism, the, the, the bone healing is going to be significantly affected. Any extraction or any infection in the bone is going to be a, a great burden on these people in terms of uh, um, and the infection in the bone, osteoradionecrosis, and other things. If there is no option of the treatment, your treatment need to be considered with the with the risk versus benefit uh, uh, judgment. That is, when there is going to be a, a, a tooth which is expected to be for extraction, we should consider whether that extraction is going to be benefiting him 
in terms of your treatment or is it going to be further or rather I would put it this way. If the tooth has to be saved for later usage, we need to assess it whether the tooth is going to be worth retaining it during the, during the radiation therapy with the risk of infection or extract it right in the beginning so that we don't come across such an infection during the radiation. So the risk versus benefit need to be assessed for our options. Uh, cancer stage need to be assessed and the progresses of such a treatment need to be assessed as a pre-treatment uh, assessment and they have to be taken into consideration. And if there is an end stage uh, cancers, this patient probably need to go for palliative support and such patient need to be given just enough dental treatment so that they don't suffer from it. And people who do have cancer surgery prognosis uh, bad need to be uh, treated holistically without much of uh, aggressive dental treatment, which is not going to be helping in any way. We were talking about a term called nadir. The nadir is the low point. The, grammatically, it means low point. It is the low point of the cells during the chemotherapy. During the chemotherapy, to control the rapidly dividing cancer cells, the cancer therapy and chemotherapy is going to be killing all the cells or eliminating all the cells in the body. And it is going to be affecting the bone marrow in terms of hematopoiesis. And the hematopoiesis is going to be affected significantly. It is like giving a shock to the hematopoietic uh, system so that they should stop producing unhealthy cells for some time and leave them with the stem cells in them with the hem hematopoietic stem cell therapy later so that they will start producing the healthy uh, cells into the blood. It also affects the, the cancer that the high intensity cancer therapy or chemotherapy also affects the normal cells along with the bone marrow, which, which includes the cells which develop, which divide rapidly such as hair lining of the mouth, mucosa lining of the mouth, cells lining the interstitial, the intestinal tracts and the blood cells such as white blood cells, red blood cells and uh, other, uh, other cells such as platelets. All these rapidly dividing cells will be affected because of the high intensity chemotherapy and the nadir is going to be the lowest point of the, the healthy cells in the, in, the, in the blood circulation. So the emergence of the nadir and the remain, returning to the normal counts is an important event during the chemotherapy. It takes anywhere between three to four weeks after the high intensity chemotherapy for the bone marrow to start producing uh, uh, the, the healthy cells. The chemotherapy cycles in such an incident, uh, such, a, such a patient will be given in cycles in repeated or frequent intervals. The cycles will be initiated during the first and the eighth day of the 28th day of cycle of the hematopoiesis. We all know the hematopoiesis will happen in cycle. During the first and eighth day of the 28th day cycle is where the chemotherapy cycle will start. NADR is usually about 10 days after the treatment. That is, after you give chemotherapy, it takes about it, about the tenth day, about around tenth day after chemotherapy, there is going to be a lowest time for the all the cells to be in the uh, in the in the in the blood circulation. So from that point of time, whether there is going to be a remission of the the healthy cells or the relapse of the disease is what is going to be determining the number of cycles and the frequency of the cycles. This is called remission and relapse cycles. And more and more remission happens, that means the patient is going to be re recovering faster. More and more relapse is happening, and these patients are going to be producing unhealthy blood cells, and they may require more number of uh, chemo cycles in their, uh, in their part of the treatment. At this point of time, the major concern is infection because of uh, low WBC counts and the platelets and which can result in bleeding in such patients. Uh, in, in, in cancer patients, there can be acute reactions uh, uh, 
because of uh, flare-ups uh, from from uh, there could be acute uh, outcomes because of uh, surgical uh, extractions and the pain resulting from surgical uh, extractions. Uh, people who are affected by head and neck cancers uh, during uh, their treatment do suffer from post-surgical pain because of resection of the uh, surgical tissue or the bone. And the oral mucositis is one of the most common outcome because of uh, radiation post-surgically or pre-surgically. And uh, because, of, because of surgical procedures and because of uh, uh, radiations, there is going to be general discomfort, hyposalivation, which is going to be lending them, uh, they will be rendering them for swallowing difficulties. And they do have problem with speaking. They do have problem with the taste perception and smell changes. Uh, and uh, all these things will happen soon after uh, the uh, surgical procedure for uh, the oral and the head and neck cancers. The treatment should be considering uh, the, the hyposalivation, that is, we need to give uh, the substitutes which are going to replace uh, the saliva as a short-term relief and uh, production of the stimulation of the saliva by, by drugs such as pilocarpine, about 5 milligrams to 10 milligrams three times a day is going to increase the production of the saliva, which is going to make the patient very comfortable. And we have saliva substitutes, uh, which is going to be used for a short terms. And uh, infections are a big threat during the immediate uh, post-surgical procedures, post-surgeries, which is either bacterial or uh, infections because of viral, inf viral conditions. The bacterial infections uh, can happen any for anybody, but viral infections are usually, usually happen because of, uh, because of uh, ending, because of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy and, uh, and uh, radiation therapy both can predispose this patient with uh, fungal infections, uh, uh, with a lot of antifungal uh, mouth rinses, both systemically and uh, topically, and prevention of uh, uh, bacterial infections with uh, chlorhexidine mouth rinses should be considered actively. The late reactions in the people who suffer from head and neck cancers are usually or chronic mucosal changes. Uh, chemotherapy, change, uh, the, the chemotherapy changes are acute and heal in weeks after cessation of chemotherapy, but radiation therapy, the reactions are going to be very late. They're going to be setting in after about a few weeks time, and they're going to be stick around with the patient for a long period of time, a long period of time due to the salivary uh, gland damages. So, caries is one of the important outcome because, because, of, uh, 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 because of salivary uh, compromise or salivary gland destructions. Uh, and salivary control, plug control, uh, topical fluoride applications need to be actively considered uh, for, for a caries prevention in those people. Radiation and its results because of uh, 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 radiation during uh, uh, radiation therapy can result in osteonecrosis and prevention should be considered right in the beginning by preventing uh, all predisposing conditions such as uh, uh, caries lesions, which are going to be uh, uh, flaring up later. So all active caries lesions should be treated right in the beginning and uncontrolled caries lesions should be treated by aggressively by extracting those teeth so that uh, we don't come across uh, post-radiation necrosis later. Uh, because of post-radiation necrosis, the patients can have painful uh, conditions. Sometimes the necrosis can happen uh, painlessly also. The necrosis can result paresthesia and anesthesia of the mandible or certain areas of the maxilla. And secondary infections can set in because of osteoradial necrosis and uh, that can result in osteomyelitis and osteomyelitis can result can can manifest in terms of sinuses tract and uh, fistula formation on the skin on the external surfaces they may even have pathological fractures because of osteo I mean osteoarthritis necrosis and uh, osteomyelitis in these people uh, late reactions continued post radiation tissue uh, damage because of osteoarthritis necrosis 
and this can be controlled by hyperbaric oxygen therapy and and uh, because of rich oxygenation of the bone and the tissues the healing can happen much effectively and thus the the necrosis and the osteomyelitis uh, consequences can be controlled uh, in these people with the head and neck uh, radiation dental implants after radiation need to be carefully considered and to be postponed as long as possible because osteointegration can be compromised because of the altered bone metabolism and and healing surgical defects can result in speech difficulties mastication difficulties and uh, it can even appear uh, affect the appearance of it this can be carefully uh, avoided by by using pre surgical impressions and immediate and to consider the immediate obturators and templates for them and during the surgery sometimes impressions can be made so that it makes a template for future surgical uh, obturators and uh, post surgical obturators for them nutrition should be carefully planned for them because of the uh, taste disturbances and the salivary difficulties in them and uh, uh, as far as possible the liquid diet need to be replaced for the uh, solid diets and uh, and uh, active involvement of the dietitian need to be involved at this place so that you can play a team role and and thus modifying the diet which is going to be suited for these people in terms of consistency and the taste for them trismus is one of the most important outcome uh, which is going to be affecting the patient on 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 chronic uh, 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 period and uh, the mouth opening is going to be very difficult for them and and that can further affect the maintenance of the hygiene because of the trismus they will not be able to brush and maintain the hygiene in the posteriors of the uh, posteriors of the mouth and which can result in and rampant uh, deterioration of uh, teeth because of the caries neurogenic pain can happen the patient may not have any active caries lesion but still patient may have a pain that could be a neurogenic uh, uh no uh, neurogenically originated uh, where you may not have any any source in the mouth but that need to be handled by uh pain clinics which are which are going to be part of your team dentofacial abnormalities need to be uh, need to be addressed at a later stage if we can plan properly we can have proper impressions pre surgical and uh, post surgically so that the maxillary facial prosthodontics can be of great value for these people to restore the speech mastication and appearance on long term uh, 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 period oral mucositis is one of the important uh, aspect which you need to know especially in people who undergo who undergo uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cell stem cell transplantation in hematopoietic uh, uh malignancies or uh, uh, hematological malignancies oral mass viral oral mucositis is something which which appears erythematous and it is ulcerative lesions in the oral mucosa extremely painful and which can compromise the nutrition and oral hygiene maintenance in such patients which can increase the local and systemic uh, infections at a later date uh the patient may not suffer much from the malignancy as such but such patients can acutely suffer from such a mucositis uh, mucositis is one of the most common outcome in people with uh, uh, uh radiation therapy and uh, cancer therapy I mean, uh, chemotherapy in patients uh, with the malignancies uh, mucositis is highly significant and sometimes it could be dose limiting com uh, complication in cancer therapy because of because of mucositis and the mucositis in turn because of uh, cancer I mean chemotherapy sometimes we may have to alter the chemotherapy uh, to control the mucositis so mucositis if uncontrolled can be a, a dose limiting complication complication for uh, cancer therapy in terms of uh, chemotherapy it is one of the most debilitating complication of uh, high dose uh, uh, chemotherapy or uh hematopoietic hematopoietic stem cell uh, 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 cell therapy uh, during the uh, high dose cancer therapy uh, high dose chemotherapy uh, mucositis is one of the most common outcome in these people 
it increases the hospitalization and inpatient charges for them because uh, it is going to be a burden for them because of mucositis they may not be able to go home for the home care and uh, not for the cancer therapy but they will be staying back in a hospital for the mucosal therapy mucositis therapy because intake is significantly compromised pain is going to be uh, very severe for them to be uh, giving them confidence and sending them home so that is going to prolong the uh, uh, hospitalization in them and in turn it is going to be a burden on economics of the whole hospitals in people with cancer uh, uh, that the uh, the world health organization has a scale for um, mucositis assessment depending on the severity we are going to offer the treatment for these people the pain can be handled in mucositis by frequent saline mouth rinses and we can encourage them to have ice chips in the mouth so that that numbs the skin before and before and during the uh, <clears throat> food intake or even otherwise also they can reduce the pain and the severity of the pain by having ice chips and uh, and uh, swishing them in the mouth rolling them in the mouth and holding them against ulcers that can give them significant uh, relief uh, from the pain topical mouth rinses with the viscous lidocaine also can can result in uh, significant pain relief and uh, the pain relief can be uh, given with lidocaine by adding uh, certain antihistamines also into the mouth so that it it uh, covers the it covers the, uh, the ulcers and give them a prolonged uh, pain relief uh, uh sucral fat or sucral mouth rinse is going to be a good relief for them but uh, there is not much of evidence available for use of sucral fat uh, in fact uh, saline mouth rinses and ice chips will give better uh, outcome than sucral fat uh, usage systemic analgesics and opioid sometimes need to be considered because of the severity and uh, to give relief for these people when the pain is uh, very severe and to give them significant pain relief in this people even patient controlled analgesia can be controlled in the patient controlled analgesia is something which you have a sedative uh, given by by clicking of a control and a patient can control himself by clicking every time it is clicked it is going to send in a, a, a designated dose for certain period so that the patient can control the amount of pain what he can have by clicking uh, the patient control the analgesia uh, 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 machine nutritional support need to be given considering the pain where the, the the diet should be as much as possible should be liquid with the soft consistency and it should be bland because any spices in them any mint in them is going to be very very painful for them so diet need to be carefully modified uh, to 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 a consistency which is soft and bland uh, total parental uh, uh, total uh, uh, parental uh, uh, substitution can be given with the hickman tube when patient cannot take anything orally sometimes in severe cases even gastrostomy tube can be inserted in them so that the food the uh, substitutes can be directly put it to the stomach by the gastrostomic tube so these are usually considered when the pain is intolerable for them when patient absolutely cannot take anything orally and uh, 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 these are the things which can be considered for so the pain is what is going to tell you what kind of uh, decision making we are going to be uh, deciding on uh, oral decontamination should be considered Uh, by frequent uh, uh, rinses with uh, proper uh, 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 chlorhexidine mouth rinses or oral care can be given by diluted uh, hydrogen peroxide in the mouth so that uh, the contamination of the bacteria can be minimized uh, palliation of the dry mouth by giving as i said the ice chips and the frequent saline mouth rinses can be uh, can be considered low level laser therapy also is 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 given for uh, mucositis uh, therapy which is very very effective nowadays uh, which is known to be giving significant relief in these people with uh, mucositis when all the other things are are failing 
in in patients in children suffering from cancers uh, the, the care is in general is going to be remaining the same but with a slight modification such as uh, 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 pre surgical and post surgical radiotherapy and post chemotherapy uh, 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 need to be always uh, kept in mind uh, pre treatment uh, dental screening need to be uh, uh, done for oral hygiene status assessment so that uh, the hygiene is maintained well so that the child will not have any post irradiation the post uh, uh, chemotherapy effects or ill effects of the uh, uh, cancer therapy preventive strategies by using the fluoride toothpaste uh, typically uh, high concentration fluoride toothpaste uh, such as adult toothpaste but the problem is most of the adult toothpaste will have mint in them there are certain prescription toothpaste will have a low mint but it can even have uh, fluoride as high as 500 ppm so that the the uh, the, the, the the initiation and the treatment of the caries lesions can be arrested uh, uh, right in the beginning uh, so that they will not suffer from any untreated caries lesions a little later professional fluoride the topical applications will be a, a, a great help for these people which should be done uh, depending on which fluoride agent we use it should be done more frequently at least once in once in few once in two months topical fluoride application need to be done uh, dietary precautions need to be carefully modified so that children being uh, uh, exposed to more of uh, the the carcinogenic diet unlike adults we need to be modifying the diet uh, which comfort them and uh, prevent any further uh, uh, caries lesions in this uh, children the uh, uh, pre dental treatment should be considering the neutrophil uh, the dental treatment uh, should be considering the neutrophil count so that uh, 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 wbc should be well above the 1000 and 2000 mm square uh, uh, count so that uh, the uh, immune system is very well supported and when such an issue happens we need to be planning our dental treatments along with the uh, uh, hematology oncologist uh, platelet should be more than 75 lakhs uh, uh, so that any bleeding uh, incidences do not happen coagulopathies can be avoided whether it can be secondary or primary to the cancer treatment decision about pulp therapy should be carefully weighed uh, by the risk versus benefit uh, earlier uh, we used to expect all the teeth which requires pulp therapies now there is not much of evidence of such a deficit depending on the status of the blood counts and the status of the therapy we can still consider uh, uh pulp therapy in children uh, who suffering from uh, uh, hematological cancers silver diamond uh, fluoride of late is a great help to control the caries lesions just apply silver diamond fluoride it uh, maintains the status quo of these uh, lesions and hardens the lesions so that we have some kind of a time before we attempt any kind of definitive treatment in them and uh, silver diamond fluoride once applied will give some time for you as much as a few months uh, for that uh, definitive treatment to be planned little later uh, we need to either uh, discontinue using orthodontic appliances or adjust the orthodontic appliances so that there will not be any problem with with any sharp edges of them uh, during the uh, chemotherapy and other cancer therapy in young children uh, when we try to use appliances and replacements and uh, such as uh, uh, crowns in children uh, there will that they should be carefully uh, uh, weighed when these children require any mris or ct scans later your metallic crowns or metallic fillings and orthodontic appliances can can cast uh, 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 image difficulties and uh, mm, on on a ct scans so any such incidences should be anticipated and uh, use uh, 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 the restorations and crowns which do not uh, uh, fall any uh, make any uh, uh, disturbances on the mris and ct scans and the disturbances on the images so zirconic crowns are known to be uh, mri friendly and ct scan friendly for these children who are going through replacements uh 
for pediatric cancer survivors who finish the long term finish the treatment and survive the long term prolonged xerostomy is one of the most important uh, uh, outcome in them many children uh, do show xerostomy tooth agenesis stunted roots enamel hypoplasia are all the outcomes of the, the chemotherapy of malignancies in children and uh, an x-ray or opg will clearly show and uh, such issues need to be uh, addressed with the appropriate care later date uh, for these children uh, uh, before we end further we have something called graft versus host disease uh, when when people go through uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation the stem cells which goes into the body can even attack the native cells so this is an immunological response this is an immunological response of the body to the uh, stem cells which are which are going to be put as part of stem cell transplant hematopoietic stem cell transplants uh, uh, can result in gvhd and this can also result because of medications involved in in uh, in in and uh, sometimes the gvhd can happen when it is associated with uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplants hematopoietic stem cell transplant usually will result in gvhd and this is going to be very certain when 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 the patients are going to be irradiated uh, such as total body body irradiation and h i mean uh, gvhd is much more certain and high dose chemotherapy especially uh before hematopoietic stem cell transplant can result can can worsen the whole situation little later uh it is it is it is known that almost four out of five uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients do suffer from gvhd uh, so it is quite troublesome almost all all the patients suffer from gvhd uh, at some point of time after hematopoietic stem cell uh, transplant sir Uh, the major difference between mucositis and uh, gvhd though though both may uh, uh, symptomatically appear similar in the oral cavity gvhd is more of a systemic condition rather than local condition it is in a systemic immune response to the cells whereas uh, the 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 liver is also affected the skin in general is affected whole of the bowel is infected in gvhd whereas in mucositis only mucosa in the oral cavity uh, is usually affected rarely even the uh, vaginal mucosa is affected but gvhd is a generalized immunological condition whereas mucositis is restricted to mouth most often the diagnosis of gvhd is mainly because of mainly by the duration of its appearance and time of its occurrence and gvhd is usually uh, confirmed by uh, biopsy mild gvhd is always desirable it is said that because it is an indicator that the hematopoietic stem cells are eliciting certain response in the body which is a positive thing to assess whether the hematopoietic stem cell transplant is really working or not the problem is when it is crossing a limit where uh, gvhd is going to be a, a complication in in patients after hematopoietic stem cell uh, transplant so gvhd can be acute and chronic uh, acute can happen within 100 days which is not very common but gvhd which which happens after 100 days which is otherwise called as chronic gvhd is one of the most common uh, condition uh, in people with uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplants the most common symptoms are dryness of the esophagus wheezing because of the dryness cough because of dryness joint pains because of destruction of the cells in the joint vaginal dryness because of the dryness of uh, vaginal mucosa oral cavity do show white hyperkeratotic hyperkeratotic uh, reticulate reticulations you see hyperkeratotic plaques erythematous chains ulcerations ranging from very small to large areas which is uh, which is very painful uh, in 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 people chronic gvhd 
rarely extend posteriorly into the oropharynx. It is very much uh, restricted to the oropharynx rather than uh, uh, involving symptomatically. Uh, lips are more involved uh, than uh, mucosa. You may see uh, children and adults with having uh, eruptions on the lips, which are very, very painful. Sometimes the eruptions of the lips will break and it will form crusts and the patient will have difficulty even opening the mouth and uh, uh, such children and adults may require uh, uh, parental nutrition or uh, even uh, gastrostomy uh, nutrition. Sir. Uh, for these people. Uh, with this, uh, we have come to the end of it. Uh, to recapitulate, we have uh, learned about the importance of oral health in systemic conditions, the role of a dentist in the team as a team player, what kind of alert clinical monitoring we need to do, that is uh, consciousness, respiration, and saturation, which should be an important eye for you to monitor the condition of the patient, whether the person is suffering from a systemic condition or not, the person need to be assessed for this uh, condition, these three parameters. Uh, we spoke about common renal disorders and how the dental health is going to be uh, affecting them. We have learned about few gastrointestinal disorders, most common gastrointestinal disorders. We have learned about endocrine disorders and their implications in the oral health, such as diabetes, I mean, diabetes mellitus because of parotid uh, conditions, thyroid conditions, and we have learned a few about uh, adrenal gland disorders. Uh, we also learned about uh, dental care in persons with uh, cancer and uh, what kind of a uh, mouth care. We have learned something about mucositis and uh, GVHD and other things. Uh, uh, hope. Uh, uh, we have a few things to take home uh, from this uh, uh, talk. Uh, thanks very much for Global Child Dental Fund, Dr. Raman Bedi. Thanks very much for taking this initiative and thanks for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank, thanks, Dr. Kolam and uh, Dr. Jacob John. And I should, I should, I should sincerely thank uh, Aneta and uh, Joha for uh, for. Uh, giving me a lot of help and following me up uh, with this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Good. Sivanas, thank you so much. That was a very comprehensive lecture and very impressive. So thank you for that. Um, I wonder whether we could now just carry on with a few questions. And I look to um, Callum. Is there any comments or questions you would like to um, to ask? Sure, thank you very much, um, Dr. Minimini. You covered a, a lot of material in that lecture, but overall, what would be your recommendations about the management of medically compromised patients in general? Um, there are some common things, I think. Um, so when thinking about the patient with medical problems or with cancer, what are some of the general things that you think um, that dentists should know and do? Uh, I think uh, the dentist should understand his role as a team member. That is the first and most important thing uh, uh, to be as a team player. Uh, that team playing is going to bring in your help to them and recognizing the conditions right in the beginning so that you provide more of a preventive care rather than trying to address complications arising from this neglected mouth a little later. So I think we need to put more emphasis on preventive care rather than looking entirely with the context of the disease. So preventive care is very, very important. Uh, and this preventive care should be followed up at every stage during the, during the, uh, the, the cancer therapy or any medical condition, and even uh, later, so that we limit the complications arising from this neglect. Thank you. I would agree with that. Um, many of these patients may need referrals to the doctor, or you may need to communicate with their medical practitioner about the patient. 
when a dentist writes such a letter, what sorts of things should be included in that letter? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's interesting because uh, 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 I work in a hospital setup. I, I work in a tertiary pediatric uh, care center. Uh, many times, a dental referral to a, a medical clinician would simply go with a, with a dental uh, history uh, as simple as putting RCT. RCT for a medical person is a randomized clinical trial. So <laughs> it's very important that do we, we demystify our, our abbreviations, use a standard abbreviations, which are recognized even by the medical personnel. That is one of the most important things which we ignore. Number two, uh, we need to inform them what is the status of this uh, uh, his, his uh, uh, oral condition, what are the prospective uh, dental issues we are going to be facing during the dental treatment. Unless we give that kind of a treatment plan for them and what, what specific advices we need to expect from them, unless we mention it in the write-up, they will not be able to help you in a specific way. So we need to give a very brief and very specific uh, request for your uh, consultations, uh, request to a medical person and try to use a simple language and recognized abbreviations. Thanks very much, that's very helpful. Good, thank you. Um, Sivan Vasa, I find that it's really important that the dentist is part of the team, but I often find in medical situations that I'm in, in the hospital that I uh, engage with, is that so often the mouth is not considered uh, in uh, a number of medical conditions. How do you think we could encourage our physicians to treat oral health more seriously? Obviously you have a great advocacy role in your hospital, but in general, what type of advice would you give to a younger uh, person starting in uh, their careers? How do we engage better with our physicians? Uh, what, how I would look at it is that uh, since uh, I'm associated with the tertiary care pediatric center, we have uh, trainee medical, uh, 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 medical residents who would be doing their fellowships and uh, specialty trainings. Uh, we do conduct a few modules to update them what is oral health and what is its influence on the medical health and how a routine care and the routine preventive care is going to be taken care. And if we can sensitize them right in the beginning, uh, addressing little later probably may not be very fruitful. So catch them right in the beginning during the training and we need to interact with them when you go into the rounds. It's it's important that you sensitize the nursing staff and even the consultants sometimes about the existing oral condition. What could have gone wrong? What could have gone wrong? How this could have prevented right in the beginning? So your interaction with your physicians with appropriate uh, information provided to them and the training of young uh, fellows will, will definitely take this in a long way. Good. That's very helpful, thank you. Jacob, any comments or questions? Thank you, uh, thank you for Roman and uh, Dr. Singh it was very comprehensive and uh, lots of eye-opening uh, uh, information that we got. Um, you, you spoke about uh, hospital dentistry. Now, uh, I, 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 I believe this is going to be more and more relevant in our practice, in our dental practice. But uh, do you see a gap in our uh, education system where we are not yet exposed our students to this kind of a situation? For example, just now you said RCT, you know, you, you, you relate RCT to them, thinking that they know what it is, but you know, in reality it is not. So how do we overcome this, this sort of a situation in, in, within the dental framework? Uh, the uh, hospital-based dental practice need to be introduced in every subspecialty of dentistry. It is not simply for the special needs. 
it should be it should be for prosthodontists it should be for endodontists so that we sensitize them how hospital based consultations will will integrate them into the medicine and and uh, our mainstream dental education unfortunately do not include this in curriculum i think uh, the 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 dentists should be sensitized about this during their internship by actually posting them by actually posting them into the hospital so that they shadow the medical fraternity and understand the medicine from the medical side of it understand the medicine from the medical side of it we are totally ignorant about how medical consultations do happen not with, from the medical context from the medical side of it so we can we can address those issues which are not being addressed by the medical people so we need to address both medical people the medical students and the dental students about how to integrate the hospital best practice see not just the dentistry part of it not just the dentistry part of it it is the holistic inclusion of many specialties into uh, the system good thank you okay okay can i just say thank you to um you very much dr namineli it's been um incredibly thorough you know you've covered so much in your lecture and i think our students are going to be um very impressed and very knowledgeable about uh, this whole area so can we say thank you very much for your time and thank you, you very much for that okay thank you dr aman thank you dr kalam and uh, jacob thank you very much thank you very much okay. take care okay just uh, i need to we need